broke my heart when you said we'll party at a My tears fell like rain. Who let all these people in here? <laughs> Most people wait to hear what's been said before they applaud. <laughs> Good afternoon. Welcome to the Heritage Foundation and our Lewis Lehrman Auditorium. We, of course, welcome those who join us on our heritage.org website on all of these occasions. Would ask everyone here to check cell phones one last time as a courtesy to see that they have been turned off. Yes, you can still take pictures, just don't take messages, please. Uh, we will, of course, post the program on the Heritage homepage for everyone's future reference. And our internet viewers are always welcome to send questions or comments at any time simply emailing speaker at heritage.org. We're pleased today that our program is co-hosted with the 60 Plus Association, not Ted Turner Television, a nonpartisan senior advocacy group that works to advance free enterprise, less government, less taxes, and their approach to senior citizen issues. And of course, our friend here, James Martin, serves as chairman of 60 Plus Association. He will be introducing our special guest, but I do want to mention that our guest has what is supposed to be his last album, which is why it's called Legacy. He has written several gospel hymns, one I want to attribute to his brother, Nick. Now, he did say out in the lobby that his father told him never to say never. So just because we're saying this is the last album, don't be surprised if there's another one. And we do have one available for you in the foyer that's separate from this that you're welcome to take upon departure. Please join me now in welcoming Jim Martin. Jim. Thank you. Thank you, John, for that introduction. And let me get the Ted Turner thing out of the way. Since he said that, I thought he was going to ask me to say, where's the check? The check is in the mail. Uh, yeah. Listen, it's an honor to be back here at Heritage and to be with Pat Boone, who, uh, by the way, is our spokesman at the 60 Plus Association. When he finally fessed up to being 60 Plus, he said he would be our spokesman. And um, I got to tell you, it's an honor to introduce him because he really needs no introduction, but this is the little bit. Every time I see him, I get to say a couple of things that weigh heavily on my heart in a very positive way. Here's a man who's been living in Beverly Hills for 50 some years. years yeah. He and Shirley have been married uh, for 60 61. years, 61 years now, out in a city where <laughs> marriages are measured by the month, perhaps. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 61 years. But as our spokesman at 60 Plus, let me just give you a little feel for this man and the way he's lived his life. He's the original American Idol, if you will. Everybody talks about the American Idol. Back some 50-some years ago, he won not one but two national contests, the Arthur Godfrey Talent Show. Some of you in this audience will remember the Ted Mack Amateur Hour. He's still in college. He gets a call to come up to New York. And they say to Pat Boone, who's 21, about to turn 22, he's going to be the youngest television uh, star uh, in, in the nation's history. And so the ad agency folks came to Pat, and they said, Pat, we, uh, we have a company down in Virginia, a tobacco company. I won't mention its name. Um, and Pat deal. said, <laughs> <laughs> Pat said uh, no, I don't do that, so I, I, don't, I don't want them to be the sponsor. So a few minutes later, the ad agency comes back and says, well, there's a company out in Missouri that sells beer and other products like that. And Pat said, no, I, I'm, I'm not going there either because I don't believe in the products. <laughs> <laughs> and, of course, they said to him, but, Pat, everybody's doing it. Everybody's doing it. And Pat said, well, I'm not going to do it. So about an hour later, they came back in, and they said with some trepidation, Pat, do you have anything against Chevrolet automobiles? <laughs> <laughs> it became the Pat, Chevy, Pat Boone Chevy Show for three or four years running. So with that, I want to introduce our spokesman at the 60 Plus Association, who needs no introduction, Pat Boone. Thank you. Thanks, Jim. I um, appreciate those kind things you say. Um, I, I do need to correct a little bit of that because it wasn't just a, a few minutes or hours. It was it was weeks in between those meetings with the ad agencies, and uh, and I'll tell you another thing. 
that the people didn't know because we weren't we weren't at liberty to talk about it. That was a gentleman's agreement that back then we wouldn't talk about some of these uh, decisions that I, as a young guy, had to make. I was in college at, at Columbia University, and I thought I was going to be a school teacher. And as these records began happening in television and even movies, so did my sex life. And I graduated at 23 from, um, uh, from Columbia University, of course, married with four kids. At 23, I was on the, I just, somebody gave me a copy yesterday to sign of that first TV guide cover. I was on several times, but this was the first time in my cap and gown and uh, at my graduation from uh, Columbia. And you open it up and there's a picture of my wife, Shirley, and four little girls. And people thought that was what I was majoring in in college. <laughs> Animal husbandry or something. I don't, uh, I, I've said, the four kids in three and a half years while I was still in college, I should have been spayed <laughs> or neutered or something. But uh, anyway, I, all of this was happening so fast, and I didn't expect it to continue. I really didn't. And there's something good about that. If you don't feel like your life's work or your destiny depends on a decision you're making, then you can maybe perhaps make a, a more rational decision. So... Yes, t turning down a cigarette sponsor because I didn't smoke and a beer sponsor because I didn't drink their product did set the stage for Chevrolet, and it was a very happy and a wonderful relationship <laughs> with Chevy. And uh, they provided, us, while I was doing their TV show, which was sometimes number one in the Nielsen ratings at that point, um, they provided a, a big, the top-of-the-line uh, station wagon for me and the kids and a Corvette fuel injection Corvette for me to drive. So it was a very happy relationship. And then during that time, I was asked, um, uh, I was approached by promoters in South Africa. They wanted me to come and perform because movies, records, television, all that were, you know, worldwide. And I'd done a couple of command performances for the Queen. I mean, all of this at a very early age. So now they, they're asking me to come perform in South Africa. And I didn't know a whole lot about international uh, affairs, but I said, I think, am I wrong? Is there a policy in South Africa? I don't know how to pronounce it. Apartheid, I do now. But, uh, and, and, and if, if people of a different color or race want to come hear me sing, they won't be allowed? And I said, yeah, that's our policy. I said, well, then, I'm sorry. I'm not trying to tell you how to run your country, but I'm not just, I'm not comfortable with that. And I, I, so I have to decline the, a very lucrative offer. Well, they came back a couple times, Jim, and I don't know if you even knew this, but, um, and they kept, uh, you know, increasing the ante. And I was saying, but you still have that policy that black people and Indians and others uh, won't be able to come see me and hear me sing if I come? Well, that's our policy. So I'm, I'm not, I'm not being in their face. I'm just saying, I'm sorry, I, I can't be part of that. Finally, there was a closed-door meeting, and uh, they said, if you'll give us your gentleman's word, there'll be no publicity about this, the government is willing to suspend the policy of apartheid for your concerts. Mm -hmm. This was 1960. And I said, you mean so anybody who wants to buy a ticket can come see? Yes. But you can't publicize it. I said, I don't want to publicize it. I, I just want to, people who want to come see me sing be allowed. So I had a very successful tour in South Africa. I had death threats, um, and, and I laugh about it now. But in Durban, which was my first appearance, we did get threats and written warnings that if I appeared on stage in this big arena with a mixed audience, which was unprecedented, that I would not leave the stage alive. So, of course, we, we had security people, and... Um, and I, I didn't usually move around the stage very much then, and it was not my want. But in this case, I was, I was very, <laughs> I, I found reasons to move and, and keep my eye on the audience at all times. And uh, there, there was no attempt on my life, and even up in Johannesburg and Pretoria and other places throughout South Africa. And then on up to Salisbury, northern Rhodesia at the time, now Zimbabwe, and I was in a big arena, 
and a, a sports, a soccer field. And I'm out in the center of the field, and they had told me, yes, anybody could come who wanted to, to buy the tickets. They could come, and they did. They were, they, they were truthful about that, but they did segregate. And so in, in Salisbury, the, the, the blacks, Indians, and others were back behind some uh, iron barriers. And in the course of my show, everything was going great, and I'm out in the middle of this field, and several thousands of people, and now I'm singing a gospel medley and, and hand clap. Everybody's going to have religion and glory. Everybody's going to be singing that story. And it was too much. And the folks, the black folks, came over the rails, <laughs> poured down onto the field, right up to the foot of the stage, blocking the view of the others that were seated in the in the grassy areas. And I thought, oh boy, we're going to have a riot right here, and I'm in the middle of it. No. The, uh, the white uh, audience just stood up and clapped along with everybody else, and, uh, and it ended peacefully. And the next day as we left Salisbury, the paper said, first, first day in many months, no reported violence. So I came home, and that was it. The, the curtain fell back, and this was 1960, and it was 10 years before I appeared there again with my daughter, Debbie. And... Um, and, and I, I'm free to talk about it now because everything has changed then. I only throw it in because these are incidents in my life where um, as a young kid from Nashville, Tennessee, growing up in a, in a Christian family, expecting to be a school teacher, loving music and singing at the drop of a hat, never asking for anything, in, <laughs> any money. And if you're in a musical town like Nashville, then... Um, you can sing a lot if you know the current songs and you have a lady who will play the piano for you and you don't expect anything in return. <laughs> I mean, the businessmen's clubs, the ladies' clubs, your ladies' Shakespeare clubs and all the high school programs and the Kiwanis and the Junior Chamber of Commerce. Hey, that Boone kid, he'll sing the current pop songs and you, don't even, you can feed him, you can give him lunch, he'll come out. <laughs> and uh, I did it just for the fun of it thinking I was on my way to being a school teacher and maybe a preacher like my Christian high school role models. And uh, God had a different idea for my life, you know, one that, of course, I cherished, but I didn't think was possible. But when it all began to happen, uh, I did feel that, that uh, it was not because I was some exceptional singer. I could carry a tune. Like Bing Crosby, my idol, used to say, just call me lucky. <laughs> well, I call myself blessed. Uh, and, uh, and so I tried to make the most of every opportunity along the way. And I had a nice accolade recently from a surprising source, Jesse Jackson. And I admire him for many reasons, not all, but uh, in political views or other things. But I, I loved it when he toured the country a long time ago talking to young black kids saying, say, I'm black and I'm proud. And I said, that's good, self-esteem. And I am somebody, and I thought, that's great, too. And so I applauded that. Well, recently I did an album, not just this Take Six uh, tribute to uh, the Ink Spots, but I did an album with uh, uh, R&B classics and the original performers like Smokey Robinson uh, and, and uh, um, for the Four Tops and Sister Sledge and Cool in the Gang and Earth, Wind, and Fire and James Brown went down to Augusta, recorded Papa's Got a Brand New Bag with James Brown. Hey, hey, Pat's got a brand new bag! <laughs> and, uh, and, and it was a tremendous album, promoting it on uh, Rainbow Coalition's uh, radio station in Chicago, talking to Santita Jackson, Jesse's daughter, who was the host of the show, talking about this album and the fun it was to record with these great R&B artists. And she said, just a minute, uh, we were talking, she said, just a minute to the engineer, is that who I think it is on the phone? Oh, put him on, and it was her dad, Jesse. Jesse Jackson stunned me. He said, you know, we first knew Pat Boone, his father-in-law, Red Foley, the great country singer, and he sang black spirituals and gospel songs, and we loved him, and he was on the WLS barn dance. Then we heard he had a son-in-law named Pat Boone, and he was singing our, our R&B music and having big hit records with, with these songs. And he says, I'm going to say something I have never said before, but I think Pat Boone did more for racial, race relations through his music than any other performer. 
I was stunned. He said, by that I mean, here's this white kid in Nashville in the South, and he's not only doing the music that, that white folks knew nothing about and didn't think they wanted to know anything about, not only is he doing the music and having hits with it, but he likes the performers, the original performers, Little Richard and Chuck Berry and Fats Domino, and making it seem, maybe the, the white folks and their parents said, well, maybe this is okay after all, if, if Pat Boone, this white Christian kid in Nashville is doing these songs. Well, for Jesse Jackson to make that kind of a statement, I was so taken back, uh, I sent him a pair of my white buck shoes. <laughs> And, and there are pictures in Ebony and Jet magazines of him holding up my white buck shoes, size 11 and a half. I made sure they were his size. And, um, and there was a bond between us because I had no idea that he, that he had this thought about what I was doing. It was unintentional. It was just a result of, of, of the opportunities that came my way. But I just want you to, to know that um, I'm here at Heritage because I greatly admire and have for so long the Heritage Foundation, all you're doing. Uh, growing up in this country, um, being blessed in so many ways, loving the country, uh, caring for our military, uh, wanting to see us live the lives um, according to the principles that we inherited that make us who we are, our own uh, political and spiritual and moral DNA that made us who we are, like de Tocqueville said so long ago, America is great because America is good. If America ceases to be good, she will cease to be great. And I subscribe to that. So Heritage Foundation continues to promote the very things that made us who we are. And we're so in need of that today. So I asked Jim if I could read you something because as you can see, I don't have any trouble just talking. <laughs> extemporaneously. In fact, uh, John said as we were coming in, we got, you got about 45 minutes, and he laughed. <laughs> as if we couldn't get it into 45 minutes or so. And thinking ahead about that, I wanted to share something with you that I wrote. I'm chairman of the advisory board at Pepperdine University and have been for almost 30 years now. This great institution that takes no money from the government, never has, never will, it's, it's now one of America's top universities, and, uh, and I've been on the board for over 40 years and chairman of the advisory board for almost 30. And we have endowed, Shirley and I, the Boone Center for the Family at Pepperdine, and teaching college courses for credit, and they line up all day to get these courses, uh, uh, teaching them how to form healthy moral relationships while they're in college, looking toward marriage, and family. And no other college in America teaches that kind of course, but other colleges are now interested in the curriculum that we have created at the Boone Center for the Family at Pepperdine. So I was asked, because I've been so involved with them and, and all that Pepperdine stands for, uh, that they asked me to deliver a commencement address. So I gave that serious thought, and again, knowing that there would be limited time and I would probably do better if I wrote it out. I did, and I just thought maybe this was a good place to, to read some of my thoughts, and I call this, uh, it's a call for a new American revolution, a manifesto, and I'll just read it to you. Uh, a number of years ago, I watched Supreme Court Justice Clarence Thomas swear in his good friend, Senator John Danforth, as our new ambassador to the United Nations. It was a solemn, moving moment, and one phrase struck me forcefully. I, I promise to defend the Constitution from enemies without and within. And I've been pondering that phrase ever since. Of course, we know we've had numerous enemies from without, and we've faced and defeated them all. Currently, we're enmeshed in a war to the death with maniacal terrorism, not some nation or other, but blood-crazed zealots, men and women, and even some children who wish us dead just because we're alive. But we're facing that challenge, and though we've been attacked on our own soil now more than once, we have taken the fight to them, and that has been necessary, and I'm grateful for it. But do we have enemies within? 
any and all of our elected representatives, do they have to defend our Constitution against enemies within our own country? I say yes. They will, or they had better, because the enemy is upon and within us already. And I know that's a startling statement. Not everybody would agree initially, but please stay with me. In 2004, uh, our country was gripped and increasingly bound by tyrants, not regents and despots from afar, but by cancerous growths from within. Long ago, it was prophesied by objective observers that America was too strong to be defeated by outside forces, but it could someday rot and crumble from within and go the way of all the other great nation states succumbing in the slime of selfishness, greed, immorality, and abuse of its own freedoms. And I don't think many of you would argue with me that there are evidences that this is happening all around us. Our valiant ship of state is listing, springing dangerous leaks in vital places, threatening, after only 230 years or so, to sink into the abyss of history. Fellow citizens, we won our first revolution under God. Now, because of the inroads that have been made already against most of the values we hold dear, I call for a new revolution, a legitimate citizen uprising to try to recreate the kind of country that we had in the beginning. What are the powerful forces steadily binding us all around, like a sleeping Gulliver in Lilliput land, robbing us of the very liberty to perpetuate the vision of our founding fathers? There are several, and they are pernicious, relentless, and eventually fatal. And I'll list the most obvious. First, ignorance. Appalling, pervasive, increasing daily. Basic literary and math skills diminish. Newspapers choose fourth grade vocabulary and short, shallow stories to cater to the lowest possible denominator, necessarily because they've discovered the median reading comprehension level in America today is at fourth grade level. American history is abbreviated, given short shrift, taught very selectively according to prevailing political correctness and intellectual bias. Left-leaning media and even liberal church groups abandon first principles and historic guidelines, constantly brainwashing the masses, cutting them adrift from ancient moorings into a sea of aimless relativism. Apathy. America grew huge and strong on the near-unanimous involvement of its citizens. In war or peace, every vote counted. Every voice could be heard. From each ward to each city hall to each county board to each state house and to each legislature to the very halls of Congress, the citizens, almost all citizens, took part, debated, came to majority agreements, and moved forward. Today, too often, often half or more of our citizens who are eligible don't even vote. They feel left out, unnecessary, distracted, cynical, alienated, and of course ignorant of the issue, so they stay home and grouse. This has to stop. Citizens, this new revolution must overthrow the bonds and blindness of ignorance and disinvolvement. Our country must be stirred and called to action. Materialism and need, and I combine these two because I believe they're related. Greed, corporate and personal, combined with inevitable dishonesty, the Bible says the love of money is the root of all evil, widen the gap between multimillionaires and the multimillions of hardworking families and retired seniors, and Jim and I in 60 plus try to address their needs all the time, principally to abolish the death tax, but also preserve Medicare, Social Security. We're working at that, not to mention the physically and emotionally handicapped and ill who can't pay all their bills or even afford their medicines even if they work two or three jobs. Well-intentioned politicians keep calling on big brother government, and of course that means the groaning taxpayers, us, to solve the problems with bureaucracy. Citizen socialism is not the answer. Social responsibility is individual, local, active response to our brothers and our neighbors' needs on a local and regional level, not necessarily big brother, Washington-based government. And the new revolution must have the sensitivity and heart and will 
to voluntarily use our vast resources to meet our human needs locally, where we know them. The early colonists who gave us this nation knew how to do that. They didn't have a big brother government to answer their needs, so they met their neighbors' needs individually and collectively where they lived. We've got to learn how to do that all over again. Humanism, immorality, and godlessness, an unholy trinity. Most Christians believe in a triune, that's a threesome, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Many Old Testament scriptures foreshadow each of these three distinct persons in the same Godhead. But today in America, we're confronted and threatened by an unholy trinity that has sunk its roots deep down into our society. Godlessness, immorality, and humanism. Remove God, as a number of perverse, determined, and well-funded activist groups are doing very effectively from public life, and a cancerous spirit of immorality seeps relentlessly across the land like a poison gas, corrupting all forms of entertainment, and I'm right in the middle of that, though I hope I stand out apart. Encouraging drugs and violence and rampant promiscuity in the streets, in schools, homes, businesses, politics, even some churches, with the inevitable surrender to humanism. Man rules his own destiny. God is dead, and if it feels good, do it. Radio personalities wince when they're fined for obscenity and sacrilege by the Federal Communications Commission, and they rail at the president or authorities demanding their First Amendment rights. But they're not seeking freedom of speech. They've had that their whole lives and careers. No, they want freedom of filth. And our founding fathers would have had them tarred and feathered and whipped in the public square for things they want to be uh, uh, greatly compensated for. Wise old Ben Franklin, certainly no religious fanatic, said only a moral and virtuous people are capable of freedom. The more corrupt and vicious the society becomes, the more it has need of masters. And that, that statement from old Ben Franklin has resonated deep into me. Only a moral and virtuous people are capable of freedom. George Washington clearly and bluntly stated, religion and morality are the twin pillars of freedom. And our fourth president, James Madison, whom many refer to as the father of the Constitution, said this, we have staked the whole of our, all our political institutions upon the capacity of mankind for self-government, upon the capacity of each and all of us to govern ourselves, to control ourselves, to sustain ourselves according to the Ten Commandments of God. This was our fourth president. No current president I can think of would dare to make a statement like that. Citizens, the enemy within has already subverted the Constitution and bound us with ever-strengthened cords of immorality and indecency and godlessness we must mount some kind of new revolution and throw them into the sea. Judicial activism, lawmaking judges, Wyatt Earps who shoot not from the hip but from the bench, and Thomas Jefferson warned us he didn't fear the executive or legislative branches of government. He knew they'd obey the citizens who elected them and could toss them out. But we would have to be very watchful lest unelected jurists bind upon us their views not the expressed will of the people. And look, in just two or three decades, renegades in black robes, and I'm referring partly to the, uh, to the Ninth Circuit out on the West Coast, the most overturned court in the nation because of the irresponsible decisions that they have made. Two or three decades, renegades in black robes, ignoring or perverting the Constitution and the Bill of Rights, have been responsible for taking prayer from school children, taking every mention of God from the public square, authorizing 60 or more million abortions, dictating severe reversals of states' rights and individual freedoms, and even now, they're redefining the institution of marriage, flying in the face of all recorded history and the very foundations of society. Citizens, I believe we need a new Boston Tea Party. Only this time, let's not waste perfectly good tea. <laughs> let's heave a bunch of black robes into the harbor with some of those vigilante judges in them. It won't hurt the robes, 
and the defrock judges can swim out and re-enroll in Constitution 101. <laughs> fellow citizens, fellow Americans, our forefathers, the early colonists, were decent, hardworking, ordinary people who rose to the challenge that confronted them, threw off the yoke of British bondage and unfair taxation, and established a new republic. Like trichinosis in pork, our muscles and our will have been sapped and weakened by insidious forces from within. Do we still have the will, the vision, the zeal, and the plain old gumption to stand up to these invaders, root them out, overturn their unconstitutional rulings, and reestablish our republic that represents not just all its citizens, but our traditional rights and morals and guidelines again? If we do, let the revolution begin. And God bless America one more time. This is what I read at our uh, commencement. I wasn't prepared for one of the effects, the results. Because I was talking to this Christian college and uh, West Coast and, and we're separate from the government, and I, I had not concentrated on the fact that many of the students are coming from all over the world to go to Pepperdine, this fine college, and some of the people whose kids were graduating are from a different kind of mindset. They come to Pepperdine because of its quality, but they don't subscribe to all the things that Pepperdine literally subscribes to, and I didn't realize that some of the people I saw walking out weren't going to catch a bus or go to lunch. Uh, it turned out that they were disagreeing with some of the things I was saying. And, um, and some of the administration said, gee, I wish you'd run this speech by us before you delivered it. And maybe I should have. But that's just the kind of guy I am. I'm not dependent so much on what people think of me. I, I'd like them to think well. But uh, look, I'm, I'm old enough now I can be independent. <laughs> and, and actually, I think I always have been. And I can speak my piece, and I can be perfectly friendly with people who speak and who think 180 degrees from me. Some of my best friends think I'm nuts, and we get along great. We, 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 we're good friends. But, uh, but anyway, that's why I'm here and feeling so supportive of and appreciative of uh, the Heritage Foundation because the whole purpose of it, I just saw Ed Meese as he left, is to preserve the kind of nation, the republic, the society that has made us who we are. And if we let our DNA be eroded and vanish, then we become something different, don't we? And uh, we've got to adhere to the same principles and defend them. As Reagan said, you know, it only takes one generation uh, to, to begin to lose everything that you had. And we have to continue to renew our dedication and our commitment and be willing to sacrifice and at least do our very part. The one thing that Jim Martin and I do very effectively uh, at 60 plus is get on the phones. And even Politico reported recently, a couple years ago now, that uh, the phone calls, robocalls we call them, they're phone calls, personal calls to millions of people who are either registered, or if they're not registered, I especially want to call them and say, look, it's your civic and if they're Christian, Christian duty to vote because we've been, we've been, we have the God-given right to elect decent and moral leaders. And if we don't, then we deserve what we get, what we are to do our civic and, and, and even biblical duty to exercise our freedoms and elect the right kind of people to lead us as our colonist and early republic citizens did. And that's why we're here today. So I'll quit talking unless there's somebody, uh, somebody we're gonna, gonna have some questions maybe. Let, let me uh, make one comment before uh, Pat does take some questions to follow up on what he just said about the robocalls. It's now public knowledge, but uh, it's so effective to have Pat Boone making calls. And I will tell you this story. It is out in the public domain now. Congresswoman Martha Roby down in Alabama a few years ago, she's been reelected. I was down campaigning with her a couple of years ago, and 
she was, when she first ran, she was in city council. It was an open seat. Mm -hmm. So everybody on both sides, an open seat, Democrats, Republicans, all running. She was all of 35 or 36, belonged to the city council. And her grandfather said to her, to his granddaughter, Martha, I think you may have bitten off more you can chew here. I mean, going to Congress from city council, <laughs> campaigning, campaigning, weeks and weeks go by, campaigns are going well. About a week out before the election, Martha gets a call from her grandfather. He says, honey, I got news for you. What's that, Grandpa? I got a call from Pat Boone last night. You're going to win this election next <laughs> Tuesday. And she, she tells, did. And she did, and she's been reelected. And one other thing, we're, we are going to have to leave in a minute. We have to go to Fox TV shortly to do a show. But let me just point out one other thing you said about Pepperdine receiving no dollars, federal dollars. Mm -hmm. At the 60-plus association, I'm often asked the difference between us and the AARP. And I like to say, well, the AARP sells products to a lot of seniors. They get a lot of your tax dollars, little known by a lot of people. We're selling a philosophy, limited government, less taxes, if you will. And again, to make another point, we live on voluntary donations, not federal tax dollars. We don't pay this entertainer. Most entertainers, they get paid for their endorsement. Pat Boone does it because he's a believer in what we in our cause. I like to say that in case any potential donors are listening and thinking that we give a portion to Boone. We do not. Having said that, Pat, can you, would you mind taking a question or two from, yeah. from the audience? Yes, sir. Yes. Uh, you mentioned the, uh, thank you. You mentioned the enemies within. Uh, I would say command central for the enemies within is probably Hollywood. What have you been able to do about that over the past several decades? Well, you'd think it would be hopeless, but uh, some things, and, and one of them is my participation with Ted Bear and Media Guide. This uh, organization, he does a fantastic job of uh, uh, making sure, like Parents Television Council, I'm on the Parents Television Council, uh, to try to clean up television as well, and we exert influence on sponsors on, on TV, and I have myself written uh, it sponsors the heads of companies like Toyota and, and General Mills and even the U.S. Army sponsoring really reprehensible television shows, asking the, the CEO, do you really want people, when they think of Toyota, to think of rape and incest and, and uh, surgical transformations that are <laughs> very reprehensible? Is this what you want them to think of? You're sponsoring their show. Do you want, when they see those things, to think Toyota? And we've had, we've had good response from the <laughs> sponsors, many of whom didn't know where their shows were being uh, sponsored. I mean, what shows were running their ads? They just had an ad agency putting them where the most eyes were. But when they learned that this is what they were paying for, they ordered the ad agencies to quit putting their ads on shows like that. And some of those shows left the air. So we have had uh, some, some success in television. Movies, Ted Bear, movie guy, he does this survey and this research every year, and he gives awards to movies that uh, have some representation of traditional values, moral values, Christian or otherwise, but moral. And, and he, he's learning that studio executives like to get awards. They, they get all the, com the condemnation they don't like that. They shrink from that. They dismiss it even, usually. But you give them awards for something good that they've done, and they'll show up. I mean, we've had people from all the major studios coming to get their awards for presenting something worthwhile and, and that whole families can go see the way we used to when the movie business was the best. And, uh, and then they find all the, the research every year renewed that if you want to make money with a movie, your best shot is to make a PG or G-rated film because they are the ones that return, on average, the best uh, return on investment. Others, studios, spend hundreds of millions or tens of millions of dollars on films that flop badly as they try to capitalize on the latest trend and the taboo, the immoral, the forbidden, the scary, the, the uh, vampires and zombies and... and, and and terrors from outer space. Meanwhile, people that are making family films, more modest budgets, but they make money. And you'd think 
that if you're going to be in the movie business, you would like actually for your films to show a profit. If, and so they're starting to get the message because faith-based films, and I've just finished making one and I'm scheduled to do another. Uh, at, at this stage in my life, I thought I was through making movies, but there's a part in a film called Boonville Redemption. It has nothing to do with my name. It's a town in Northern California. Seems to be just a coincidence. I've been there 100 years. And this drama takes place in this little rural community called Boonville. And my musical conductor, uh, Dave Siebels, uh, was booked, uh, signed to do the music score for the film. And he said, you know, I work for a guy named Boone. You're supposed as a part in this film for him. And the director, producer said, well, if he's willing to play an 80-year-old doctor, <laughs> he said, it's, it's a pivotal role. It would be good. You think you, and, and when Dave asked me, I said, well, I've been practicing the 80 part. Uh, I haven't practiced medicine, but I'd be happy. So I play the doctor, and I wind up narrating the film. It has, it, it's, it hopefully be uh, distributed in the fall. But faith-based fil films, the studios are discovering, even have created faith-based film subsidiaries like Sony Affirm Pictures. They did Heaven is for Real about the little boy four years old that went to heaven and came back to tell us about it. That film uh, has done some 70 or 80 million on a budget of about two or three million. God's Not Dead with Kevin Sorbo, put out by a, a, a fairly new company called Pure Flix, uh, about an atheist teacher trying to enforce his views on his psychology class in college and the one student that decided to, on his assignment to prove the existence of God, and he does. Um, this film is $90 million on a, on a 2 or $3 million budget. Uh, I won't tell you the budget of Boonville Redemption, but we're hoping for the same kind of <laughs> percentage of return, and I'm scheduled now to appear in God's Not Dead 2, playing uh, another uh, a mature gentleman <laughs> in, uh, in this film. Uh, important role, though. And uh, so, yes, when we make faith-based films and let the studios know that, that actually the public likes to go and will pay money to see them, uh, they th start thinking, well, how do we make films like that? Because if it's going to make money, we're for it. <laughs> they don't intend to just make immoral films for their own sake. They just want to make big box office numbers. Question? How do you feel about the efforts to... Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Um, how do you feel about efforts to uh, restrict voting uh, through uh, requiring uh, state IDs or curtailing uh, uh, mm -hmm. early voting uh, schedules and so forth and so on? Well, of course, I want every citizen to vote. I said every citizen <laughs> to vote. <laughs> and, uh, and I don't understand the problem. I really don't, un I don't know what the issue is. Because if a person wants to go vote, that person probably has a driver's license, or that person probably has a birth certificate, or some way. I mean, if you ha you can't go to Costco without proving you you have that kind of identification, <laughs> and then why should you be allowed to vote if you're not willing? And to say that some people are unable, somehow economically or any other way, to prove their their citizenship or their right to vote is spurious to me. I don't get it. I really don't understand that. I just think that the vote is such a sacred privilege, and it is restricted to citizens, and we ought to be able to see that that happens. And if you have to bus people there, if they couldn't afford to get there, I know there are ways, unfortunately, to corrupt the process of early votes. We know that's already happened, because believe it or not, there are people that will actually uh, doctor those stats if they have a chance. Sometimes they do it, can do it through the, uh, uh, what's the state official that, uh, Secretary of State in states, who have to kind of monitor that. And uh, there have been actual suspicions that maybe some of those early vote counts were uh, engineered somehow. So I, I know American citizens shouldn't even think of such a thing, but somebody has. <laughs> yeah, any other question? We're going to have to cut one more, and we're going to have to go on the, to, to yeah. Fox. Uh, thank you. You mentioned, uh, you talked about strong political leaders that people should um, elect. If you look at the growing field of presidential candidates, what's your take on, on, on this field, and who are you going to endorse? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's early, because we, 
we uh, 60 plus uh, does try to uh, to you know get people to vote and and right now it's early for us to be wouldn't you say Jim for us to be thinking of advertising or endorsing any particular candidate there's a great field of good responsible people uh, the the process is going to winnow out some uh, a great many in fact and uh, it, it I, I love the process of the campaign speeches where people speak both from prepared speeches and extemporaneously and they wind up telling you what hopefully what they really believe and what they really stand for I'm praying for and we are all praying for leadership that will if they promise transparency will actually be transparent and there won't be parts of their past uh, sealed off that the public never know what their school passport and travel records were because when that happens you have to think what could the reason possibly be for a man not a president not wanting anybody to know about his early passport travel and school records unless he thinks that somehow it would be injurious to him or even his eligibility to be president uh, these things uh, that we allow to happen <laughs> I just shouldn't be. So we look for candidates that it's all out there. They say what they really believe. Donald Trump entered the race. That's one thing you won't have to worry about with him. He will tell you what he believes. And uh, so will Mike Huckabee. So will Scott Walkers. I mean, there. Uh, for that matter, so will Jeb Bush and all the rest. So we'll. It's a great winnowing process, and I believe we're going to come up with a good team of of potential leaders, and I hope we elect folks that are going to defend, first of all, the Constitution and who we have been and who we want to be as a nation. Uh, thank you, Pat. We are going to have to leave. But before we do, let me close on this note about this gentleman here. You know, out there in La La Land, as they call it, you've uh, reached the, the top of your profession if you get a star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame. Well, Pat Boone does not have a star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame. Pat Boone has three stars on the Hollywood Walk of Fame. One for his movie career, one for his music career, of course, and one for that famous TV show that we mentioned earlier. So uh, that Let just me amend that, though, with one statement. <laughs> All right. The reason for that is when they first instituted the Walk of Fame, I was on the first list. Uh, <laughs> and so I think Roy Rogers had four. Bing Crosby had four. Uh, I think Gene Autry had three. And so I, I did have three stars, uh, but it's because they were just inaugurating the thing. Now they make such a big deal about one, and I, I try not to feel superior. <laughs> <laughs> I, I know it, it means a lot to them. And, and also, by the way, it costs you a lot of money to get one of them now. Somebody has oh, to pay right. twenty five yeah. to 30000 to get one of those. Uh, where mine were free, so of course I took them. <laughs> <laughs> Again, folks, those uh, white bucks he referred to there, a pair of them, and on this, this was a cover on Rolling Stone magazine, one of their original magazines, yeah. a few years ago, and we liked that. This was your they 50 called year. me the Great White Buck. <laughs> great time. White Buck. Folks, again, thank you very much, and we do have to move on. Thank and you. God bless Heritage.